you are CUBE alumni. Live from Munich, Germany, it's the CUBE. Covering DataWorks Summit Europe 2017. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Hello everyone, welcome back to live coverage at DataWorks 2017. I'm John Furrier with my co-host, Dave Vellante. Two days of coverage here in Munich, Germany, covering Hortonworks and Yahoo presenting Hadoop Summit now called DataWorks 2017. Our next guest is Carlo Vaiti, who's the HPE Chief Technology Strategist, uh, EMEA Digital Solutions, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, John. So we were just chatting before we came on of your historic background, IBM, Oracle, now HPE, yep. and back into the saddle there. Um, Don't forget Sun Microsystems. Sun Microsystems, sorry, <laughs> Sun, uh, yeah. I mean, great, day. great run. Yep. Uh, you've seen the computer revolution happen. Sure. Um, I worked at HP for nine years, uh, in, from 88 to 97. Again, Dave uh, was a uh, uh, premier analyst during that run of client-server. We've seen the computing revolution happen. Now we're seeing the digital revolution where you know, the iPhone is now 10 years old, cloud is booming, data is at the center of the value proposition, so a completely new disruptive sure. capability. Sure, yes. So what are you doing as the CTO, Chief Technologist for HPE? How are you guys bringing this story together? Because there's so much going on at HPE. You've got the uh, services split, you've got the software split, and HPE's focusing on the new style of IT, as Meg Whitman calls it. So yeah, we, my role in EMEA is actually all about having uh, basically a uh, visionary a kind of strategy role for what's going to be HPE in the future in terms of IT. And one of the things that we are looking at is specifically to have, we, we, we split our strategy in three different aspects, or three transformation areas. Um, the first one which we usually talk is what I call hybrid IT, right? Which is making, making services around either on-premise, on cloud for our customer base. The second one is actually power the intelligent edge. So it's actually looking after our yeah. collaboration and uh, we acquire Aruba components. And the third one, which is in the middle, and that's why I'm here at the Data Work Summit, is actually the data analytics aspects. And we have a, t a couple of solutions in there. One is yeah. enterprise grade Hadoop, which is part of this. So this is actually how we generalize all the, all the figure and the strategy. It's interesting, Dave and I were talking yesterday, being in Europe, it's obviously a different size show, it's diff smaller than the uh, DataWorks or Hadoop Summit in North America in San Jose, but it, there's a ton of Internet of Things, IoT or IIoT, because you know, here in Germany, obviously, a lot of industrial sure. Uh, sure. nations, but in Europe in general, um, a lot of smart cities initiatives, a lot of mobility, a ton of Internet of Things opportunity, more Absolutely. than in the US. Can you comment on how you guys are <laughs> tackling the IoT, because it's an intelligent edge, certainly, sure. but it's also data. It's in your sure. wheelhouse. Yes, sure. <laughs> so I'm actually working, it's a good question, because I actually work in a couple of projects in Eastern Europe, where it's, it's all about industrial IoT analytics. IIoTA, that's the new terminology we use. Mm. So what we do is actually we analyze from a business perspective what are the business pain points in an oil and gas company, for example, and we understand, for example, what kind of things they need and they must have. So, and, and what I'm saying here is, one of the aspects, for example, is the drilling opportunity. So how much oil you can extract from a specific uh, rig in the middle of the North Sea, for example. This is one of the key questions because the customer want to understand in the future how much oil they can extract. The other one is, for example, the upstream business. So on doing it on the, on the retail side and having, say, when my customer is stopping in a gas station, I want to go in the shop immediately giving, I don't know, my daughter a kind of campaign <laughs> for the Barbie, because they like the Barbie. So, IoT, industrial IoT, help us in actually making a much better customer experience, and that's the case of the upstream business, but it's also helping us in actually much faster business outcomes. And that's what the, what the customer wants, right? Because, and I was talking with your colleague before, I'm talking to the business guy. I'm not talking to the IT anymore in this kind of place. Industrial IoT allow us actually to change the conversation at the industry. Well, level. these are first time conversations too. I mean, you're Correct. getting at you know, the kinds of business conversations that weren't possible five years ago. Yeah, sure. I mean, sure. In 10 years ago, they would have seen fantasy. Now I, they're I, reality. I, the, the role of analytics, in my opinion, is becoming extremely key 
And I said this morning, for me, my best sentence is that the data is the stone foundation of the digital economy. I continue to repeat this terminology because it's actually where everything is starting from. So what I mean is, let's, let's take a look at the analytic aspect. So if I'm able to analyze the data close to the shop floor, okay, close to the shop manufacturing floor, if I'm able to analyze my data on the rig in the oil and gas industry, if I'm able to analyze doing pre-processing analytics with Kafka, Druid, this kind of open source software, where close to the intelligent edge, then my customer is going to be happy because I give them very fast response and, and the decision maker can get the decision in a faster time. Today, it takes a long time to take this type of decision. So that's why we want to move into the power intelligence. So you're saying data is foundational, but if you get to the intelligent edge, it's dynamic. It's dynamic. So you have a dynamic, re a reactive, real-time, time series, or presence of Correct. data, but Correct. you need the foundational pre-data. Perfect. And is that, so is that do, kind of what you're yes, getting at? Yes, and that's the first step. Pre-processing analytics is what we do. In the next generation of what we think is going to be industrial IoT analytics, we're going to actually put massive amount of compute close to the shop manufacturing floor. We call it internally, or actually externally, convergent plan infrastructure. And that's the key point. Convergent right? plan? Convergent plan infrastructure, CPI. If you look at Google, you will find it's a, it's a solution we bring in the market a few months ago. We announced it in December last year. Yeah, and Antonio Smart, he also yeah. had a, uh, uh, converged systems as well. Yeah, so that's, yeah that's a converged compute at the edge, basically. Correct. Converged very compute at the edge, and and very powerful, and we run analytics on the edge. That's which the which uh, we love, because that means you don't have to send everything back to the cloud because it's too expensive, it's going to take too long, Late. it's Correct. not and the bandwidth on the network is yeah, much less. There's no way that's going to be successful it unless you go time. to the edge. It and, takes time. Well, the cost. Now, now, the other thing is, of course, you've got the Aruba asset Absolutely. to be able to to, I always say, joke, you know, connect the windmill. Um, but, Carla, can we go back to the IIOTA sure. example? Yeah. And I want to help, help our audience understand sort of the, the new HP post these spin merges. So, previously you would say, okay, we have Vertica, you still have partnership, or you still own Vertica, but it, after, absolutely, after absolutely. September 1st, Part you know, of the it goes right. Columnar strategy uh, yes, absolutely, but so, but the new strategy is to be, you know, more of a platform for a variety of technologies. So how, for instance, would you solve or did you solve that, that problem that you described? What so, did you actually deliver? So, so again, as I said, we are, especially in the, in the industrial IoT, we are in ecosystem, okay? So we're one element of the ecosystem solution. For the oil and gas specifically, we're working with other system integrator, we're working with oil and industry gas expertise, like the XC company, right? The company that we just split a few uh, days ago. Mm -hmm. And, and we're working with them. They're providing the industry expertise. We are infrastructure provider around that, and the services around that for the infrastructure element. But for the industry expertise, we try to have a, a kind of little bit of knowledge to start the conversation with the customer. But again, my, my role in, in the strategy is actually to be a ecosystem uh, digital integrator. Mm. That's the new terminology we would like to bring on the market because we really believe that's the way HP role is going to be. And the relevance of HP is totally depending if we're going to be successful in this type of things. Okay, now a couple other things you talked about in your sure. keynote. I'm just going to list them and then we can go wherever we want. Yeah, there was no Data Lake 3.0, yeah. storage disaggregation, which is kind sure. of interesting, because sure. uh, it's been a problem. Uh, Hadoop sure. as a service, uh, real time sure. everywhere, and then analytics sure. at the edge, which we kind of just, just talked we about. Talked about um, let's pick one. Uh, let's start with Data Lake 3.0, <laughs> what, what is that? So you know, Don, John doesn't like the term Data Lake, he likes Data Ocean. <laughs> I like Data, data ocean. ocean. Is data, yeah. data Lake 3.0 becoming an ocean? Or, you know? It's becoming an ocean. <laughs> So Data Lake 3.0 for us is actually com uh, following what is going to be the future for HDFS 3.0. So we have three elements. The erasure coding feature, which is coming on HDFS. The second element is around uh, uh, having HDFS data tier, multi-data tier. So we're going to have faster SSD drives. We're going to have uh, big memory nodes. We're going to have GPU nodes. And the reason why I say disaggregation is because some of the worker will be only compute, and some of the worker will be only storage, okay? So we're going to bring, and, we, and the customer require this because 
is getting more data. And they need to have, for example, Yarn application running on compute nodes. At the same level, they want to have storage compute block, storage, storage components running on the storage model, like HBase, for example, like HDFS 3.0 with the multi-tier option. So that's why the data disaggregation, or disaggregation between compute and storage is the key point. We call this asymmetric, right? Hadoop is becoming asymmetric. It, That's it, what it means. And the problem you're solving there is when I add a, a node to a cluster, I don't have to add compute and storage together. I can no, disaggregate and correct. choose whatever I Everyone need based on the workload. They're doing the all multi-tenancy kind of workload, and they are independent and they scale out. Of course, it's much more complex, but we have actually proved that this is the way to go because that's what the customer is demanding. So 3.0 is actually functional. It's erasure coding, you said. It's sure. a data tier. You've it's got -tier different tier memory and levels. And I forgot to mention the um, containerization of the application, having Dockerize the application, for example, using uh, Mesosphere, for example, right? So having the containerization of the application is one other element because what we do in Adobe, we actually build the different clusters that need to talk to each other and exchange data in a faster way. And solution like a product life cycle manager from Hortonworks is actually helping us to get this connection between the cluster faster and faster. And that's okay. what the customer wants. And then Hadoop as a service, is, yes. is that an on-prem solution? Is that a hybrid solution? Is it a cloud solution? Uh, all three? I can offer all of, all of them. Hadoop as a service could be run on-premise, could be run on uh, public cloud, could be run on Azure, or could be a mix of them partially on-premise and partially on -premise. And what are you seeing with regard to customer adoption of, of, of cloud and specifically around Hadoop and big data? I think uh, the way I see the adoption is all the customers want to start very small. The maturity is actually better from a technology standpoint. If you asking me the same question maybe a year ago, I would say that's ah, difficult. Now I think they, they got the point. Every large customer, they want to build this big data auction, not data lake, <laughs> data ocean, whatever you want to call it. Love that. Uh, <laughs> they want to build this data ocean, and, and, and the point I want to make is they want to start small, but they want to think very high, very big, right, from that perspective. And the way they approach us is we have a kind of methodology. We establish the maturity assessment. We do a kind of capability maturity assessment. So we define it. If the customer is actually a pioneer or is actually a very traditional one, so it's very slow in growing, once we determine where is the stage of the customer is, we propose some specific proof of concept. Okay. In, and in three months, usually, they were putting this in place. You That's also talked about real time everywhere. We, we, in our research, we talk about uh, you know, the, the historically batch, you had batch, you have interactive, and now you have what we call continuous or real time streaming workloads. How prevalent is that? Where do you see it going mm -hmm. in the future? So I think it's, a trend, it's another trend for the future, as I mentioned this morning in my uh, presentation. So, and Spark is actually doing a, the open source and memory engine process, is actually the core of this stuff. We see 60 to 70 times faster analytics compared to not to use Spark. So many customers are implementing Spark because of this. The requirement are that the customer needs an immediate response time. Okay, for a specific decision making that they have to do in order to improve their business, in order to improve their life. But this requires a different architecture. Um, I have a question, because you, you've lived in the United States, you're, you're obviously global and spent yep. a lot of time in Europe as well. And a lot of times, you know, people want to discuss the differences between, let's make a specific here, the European continent and, and North America. And from a sophistication standpoint, same, we can agree on that. But there are still differences. Um, maybe more greater privacy concerns, the whole thing with the cloud and the NSA in the United States created some concerns. What do you see as the, the differences today between North America and Europe? So, um, from my perspective, I think we are much more, um, for example, takes IoT, industrial IoT. Mm -hmm. I think in Europe we are much more advanced. Yeah. I think in the manufacturing and the automotive space, the connected car kind of things, autonomous driving, this is something that we, all, we know already how to manage, how to do it. I mean, Tesla in the US is a good example that what I'm saying is not true, 
but if I look at, for example, large German manufacturing car, they always implemented these type of things already right. today. For years. So that's, yeah. that's the difference, right? I think the second step is about um, the uh, faster analytic approach. So what I mentioned before, the power of the intelligent edge, in my opinion at the moment, is much more advanced in the US compared to Europe. But I think Europe is trying to run back and, and going on the, same, on the same route. Because we believe that putting compute capacity on the edge is what actually the customer wants. But and that's the two big differentiators. The other there. two big external factors that we, we like to look at are, are Brexit and Trump. So, oh, wow. so <laughs> Yeah, how about Brexit? Is it now that it's starting to sort of actually become, you know, be, begin the process? Is it? How should we think about it? Is it overblown? Is it? Is it? Is it critical? What do you? What's your take? Well, I think it's too early to say. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, UK just split a few days ago, right? Officially, it's going to take another 18 months before it's going to be completed. Uh, from a commercial standpoint, we don't see any difference so far. We're, we're actually looking, working in the same way. Yeah. But for me, it's too early to say if there's going to be any implication on that. And we don't know about Trump. We don't have to talk about no, it. But but uh, but the <laughs> but the but the I saw some data recently yes. that you know, European yes. sentiment, business sentiment is 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 trending stronger than the U.S., which is which is different than it's been for the last many years. Um, yes. What do you see in terms of just sentiment, business conditions in Europe? Do you see I it pick it's, up? It's getting better. It's getting better. I mean, if I look at the major countries, uh, the PNL is going uh, positive, one one point five percent. So I think from from that perspective, we we are getting better. Uh, of course, we're still suffering from the Chinese and Japanese market sometimes, especially in some of the big large deals. Uh, the intrusion of the Japanese market, I feel it, and the Chinese market, I feel in that. But I think the economy is going to be okay, mm. so it's going to be good. Carlo, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing no your problem. insight. Um, final question for you. Yes. You're new to HPE, okay? Yes. We have a lot of history, obviously. I was been a long part of my career there, early yeah. in my career. Dave and I have covered the transformation of uh, HP for many, many years with theCUBE, certainly. Um, what attracted you to HP and what would you say uh, is going on at HP from your standpoint that people should know about? So. I think the, the number one thing is that for us, the world is going to be hybrid. It means that some of the services that you can implement either on-premise or on, on a cloud could be done very well by the new Point Next organization. I'm not part of the Point Next. I'm in the EG Enterprise Group division, yep. Yep. but I'm fun for Point Next because I believe this is the future of our company, is on the services side. That's and it's the, you know, I would just point out, Dave and I, will, our commentary on it, the spin merge has been, yeah. create these highly cohesive entities, yes. very focused, with yes. Antonio now running Correct. EG, Correct. Uh, big fans of, where it's actually an efficient business model. Absolutely. Uh, and Chris Shu's running the, the sure. micro focus. It's Cuba a very alumni. efficient model, yes. Well, congratulations Indeed. and thanks for coming on and sharing your Thank insights you, here in Europe. And certainly, it is an IOT world, IIOT, I, I love the yes. analytics story, foundational services. Uh, it's going to be great, open source powering it, and this is theCUBE opening up our content, sharing that with you. I'm John Furrier, Dave Wan. Stay with us for more great coverage here from Munich after this short break.